In this video, I'm going to take a look at some examples of imaginary numbers, which is the imaginary component of a complex number, and we're going to show how they relate to the complex class. Let's consider the square root of 81, and we know it to be equal to 9, because 9 times 9 equals 81. Of course, if we take the square root of 81, we can rewrite this as shown here, the square root of 9 times 9. Now, 9 times 9 is obviously equal to 81. Now, we've looked at this in a previous video, the ability to split up, as we can see here. And what we can now do, we can say, well, this is the same as the square root of 9 times the square root of 9. And obviously, the square root of 9 is 3, so we can go on to say that this is equal to 3 times 3, which is clearly going to be equal to 9. So following this route, we can see we end up with 9, which we said right at the beginning here that the square root of 81 was 9. Let's now consider this, the square root of minus 4. Now, we know we cannot find the square root of a negative number. Well, we can't find it. I'll have the result that is a real number. But what I'm going to do with the minus 4 here, the square root of the minus 4, I'm going to split it, as you can see here, to 4 times minus 1. And of course, this 4 times minus 1 is minus 4. So following the same approach I used above, I can now say that this is equal to the square root of 4 times the square root of minus 1. Now, we know the square root of 4 is 2, and we know for the square root of minus 1, we can replace that by i, so we end up with it equaling 2 times i, where this 2 is the square root of 4, and this i is the symbol that's replaced the square root of minus 1 that we can see here. Now, we can further write this as equal to 2i. In other words, we don't need the multiplication sign between the 2 and the i. This means we have two lots of the square root of minus 1. Of course, 2i is how you would expect to see it written in mathematics. The square root of minus 4 is 2i. However, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take the same thing here. I'm going to say, right, I've got 4 times minus 1. I know I can split this up, as I did above. And on this occasion, what I'm going to write out is this. And you can see I'm now using j, because now I'm reflecting onto how it will look in Python. And of course, this will equal 2j. And j is used to represent the square root of minus 1. So in Python, if you remember, we use j. We don't use i to represent the imaginary components of a complex number. OK, let's have a look at another example, the square root of minus 16. What I can do here, I can write this down as 16 times minus 1. And of course, I can now split this up as the square root of 16 times the square root of minus 1. And obviously, the square root of 16 is 4. And I can replace the square root of minus 1 by j, as you can see here, and that will now equal 4j. So the square root is 4j, where 4j is the imaginary component of a complex number, and we use the j, as I've already said, because we're using Python. Let's now consider another example. Let's consider the square root of minus 2. Now, I can write that out as shown here, 2 times minus 1. And of course, we're taking the square root of 2 times minus 1. And this will therefore equal the square root of 2 times the square root of minus 1. Now, the square root of 2 is 1.4142 to so many decimal places. And of course, the square root of minus 1 we can see is j. So the square root of minus 2 we can see we're going to write out, as you can see here, 1.4142j. Of course, there's more decimal points in the value, but I've just taken this to these four decimal positions here. So we should know that the square root of minus 1 is j. We've also gone on to show in this video that the square root of minus 4 is 2j, and that the square root of minus 16 is 4j, and that the square root of minus 2 is 1.4142j. Let's now consider this computer program. And you can see on this line, I'm importing CMath. On this line, I am using the CMath module. And from the CMath module, I'm using the square root function. And I'm finding the square root of minus 1. So what this is going to do, it's going to find the square root of minus 1. And it's going to assign it to var1. So in other words, what this line is doing, it's finding this, the square root of minus 1. And it should be j 
the result. So var underscore 1 should have a relationship with the j. Now this line, what I'm doing, I'm finding the square root of minus 4. And we can see up here that the square root of minus 4 is equal to 2j. And these two lines are finding the square root of minus 16 and minus 2 respectively. And these four lines, they're printing out each of the variables in turn. And if we look to the runtime for this, this is what we get. And you can clearly see that when I print var1, I get 1j, which is, of course, what this is telling us here. And if you remember, Python will always stick a 1 in front if it's just a j. If we have a look at this, this is 2j, which is output by this, and the line responsible for giving this variable 2j is shown here and of course that's the square root of minus 4 and if we come up here we can see the square root of minus 4 is 2j and here we can see that this line is outputting 4j and this line is outputting this value 1.4142 all these decimal places continue and then end with the j so this is in fact this here the square root of minus 2 whereas here I've only gone to these number of places in my answer I've not made it as accurate as I could if you come and look at these digits here you can see they're the same so this is Python's more accurate version of this one here but you can still see that Python had no difficulty finding the square root of minus 2 now you can see here I've got the same program that I was just considering and here is the runtime for that program and what I want you to consider is this. This is 1j. Now this 1j is the imaginary component of a complex number. And you would expect to see the 1j, as well as all these other examples, as part of a complex number. But if I just look at this one, this is equivalent to the following. This is 1j is saying there's no real component, but there is a 1j component, where the j represents the square root of minus 1. Well, this 2j here, well, that would look like this. 2j, no real component, plus 2j, which is the imaginary component. So if we look to the 4j, what we can expect that to look like as a complex number is 0 plus 4j. And finally, if we have a look at this one here, which I'm showing truncated in terms of the decimal places, that is actually the complex number that has the real component of 0 and the imaginary component, as you can see here. So when we talk about an imaginary number, we really need to think, well, this is 2j, which is the imaginary number, and we can think of it as being like this. Now, the only reason it didn't appear like this in the code here is I haven't used an appropriate formatting to show it in this form. But I was just concentrating in this video on the imaginary bit. But when you see 2j by itself, it's a good idea to remember what well, that is actually 0 plus 2j, where the 0 represents the fact that there is no real component in the complex number. Now, this is the program we've just been considering with the addition of the following. And if we consider this line, you can see I'm outputting the value of var underscore 1. And here I'm saying what the type of var underscore 1 is. And you can see in each case I'm outputting the type of the appropriate variable. So if I look at the runtime for this, what I'm going to see is the following. And you can see that this line outputs 1j because we're finding the square root of minus 1. And then here you can see we're saying that it's class of complex. Now what this is telling me is that this is a variable and it's a name that's bound to an instance of the complex class that has the value 1j. If I look to this line, I'm printing out var underscore 2, which we can see is 2j, and then I'm printing out the type of var underscore 2, which you can see is still class complex. So what this line is telling me is that this variable is the name bound to the instance of the complex class that has the value of 2j. Why 2j? Because we took the square root of minus 4 here, as you can see. And of course, this line printed out 4j and the type, which was of class complex. And this line printed out var underscore 4, which is this value, and it printed out the type, which is class complex. So we can see all of these variables here are instances of the complex class. In other words, objects of the complex class. Now, the key points I would like you to take from this video 
are as follows. Here you can see I'm taking the square root of minus 4. And of course I can rewrite this as shown here. 4 times minus 1. Because 4 times minus 1 is minus 4. So here I'm taking the square root of minus 4. And here I'm effectively doing the same. I'm taking the square root of 4 times minus 1. Which is the square root of minus 4. But I know I can split this up as shown here. Into the square root of 4 times the square root of minus 1. And of course the square root of 4 is 2. And the square root of minus Minus 1 we replace that with a j so I end up with 2 times j which we can write as 2j so let's look at an example of an imaginary number 2j and what we have to realize it is a number it's not a number like an integer or a float it is a number however that's an instance of a complex class 2j is an imaginary number but a number nonetheless of course, 2j is the imaginary part of a complex number, so we can always say that if we have a variable that's assigned 2j, then that variable will be the name bound to an instance of the complex class. Of course, I'm just showing one example here, 2j, but if I was to show this here, where xj, where I'm saying x can be any number, like 55.3 minus 157.1, it is representing all of the kinds of numbers we can have in the position of j here and um, xj is a number and it's part of a complex number it's the imaginary part of a complex number and if you were to have a variable assigned xj where x was a variable given a value then it would be a member of the complex class you'd have a name bound to an instance of the complex class of course in this video I've been focusing in on the imaginary part of the complex number but I think it's important that when you think of the imaginary part of a complex number or of an imaginary number you need to bear in mind this that if you have an imaginary number it's a good idea to think of that as shown here the imaginary number is equal to a complex number where the real part is zero and the other part with the xj, which is obviously the same as this, is the imaginary bit. So if you see xj, think of it as shown here. It's the real part being zero and the imaginary part being xj. So if this was 2j, this would be zero plus 2j. So there's no misunderstanding. What I'm saying with this is that if there's just an imaginary part, you can think of it as being like this. The imaginary part being added to the real part where there is no real part. But of course, in reality, you will see lots of complex numbers that will have both a real and an imaginary part. And I'm going to show that with an example here. This is a complex number that has the real part of 2 and an imaginary part where the value is 5, 5 lots of j, 5 lots of the square root of minus 1. So you would only think of this if the imaginary was by itself with no real part. But this is a proper example of a complex number with both parts present. This is a complex number with only an imaginary part and the real part is set to zero. Check out the supporting website for these videos. In addition, why not follow me on Twitter as I issue a tweet every time I upload a new video.